Been preaching sermons from the jailhouse, and this will be the last one tonight, but we will be in the book of Philemon. Easy to find, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, Titus, that's your big T books in the New Testament. Then you have Philemon after Titus, and then Hebrews, and then James. So if you found it, say amen. If you have, haven't found it, say pray for me, amen. Philemon, it, you can pick any chapter you want, 25 verses. Let's stand. For the reading of God's Word, we're going to read the first seven verses. We will be completing this book tonight. It's small, but it's powerful. And there's some things in it that we need to learn. Paul is in prison during this time, and he writes this book of Philemon with his own handwriting. He signed this letter. Wouldn't you like to have that today? He signed this letter. Paul wrote this with his own hand. And this is a book or a letter that is written to an individual. It is not written to the church, it's written to an individual by the name of Philemon. And we'll get into that in just a little bit and show you what outstanding blessings there are. Has it ever occurred to you just how much Paul shook the world from prison? I mean, while he was under custody, home arrest, he shook the world, bringing great messages to the church while he was even in prison, amen. What a blessing he is. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, Oh, I would that all of you were. And Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and labor, fellow labor. And to our beloved Aphia and our Chippus, our fellow soldier. And to the church in thy house, grace be unto you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God making mention of thee always in my prayers hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus Christ toward all, and toward all the saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we, he's speaking of John Mark and speaking of Demas and Luke that are in jail with him, for we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee. Brother. Isn't that beautiful? We are refreshed by thee, brother. Amen. I love that phrase. Brother. He calls Philemon brother. I want to use for a subject tonight a letter from jail. You may be seated. A letter from jail. Notice Paul in this letter to Philemon never calls himself an apostle. He never mentions that he's an apostle. In his other writings he does, but in this letter that he sends to Philemon, he does not say he is an apostle. He says, I'm a fellow laborer with you. I work with you. You're my brother. Now he's in Rome. He's in prison. And being in Rome in prison, this is his first time in Rome as a prisoner, Paul. And during that time he was in prison, he wrote the book of Ephesus, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. These are prison epistles for them. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, prison epistles. And he's writing to Philemon about something that is very serious because Philemon was a person who no doubt had a lot of wealth. He was a man of great ability. He had so much wealth that his house was big enough to house the, Clo the, the church of Colossae. The church of Colossae met in the house of Philemon. Back then, they met in houses. They didn't have buildings, so this man not only was rich to have a house big enough to accommodate the fellow believers in Christ in, in his home, Philemon's home, he also had several slaves, servants that he had. Now, 
any kind of slavery is wrong. Period. Wrong, wrong, wrong. But in the day that Paul spoke to Philemon, he had a runaway slave. The slave runs away, and he ends up in Rome, running from Philemon. His name is Onesimus. And when he gets to Rome, he thinks he can bleed in because Rome has somewhere between 40 and 60% of its population were slaves. Can you imagine that? 40 to 60%, depending on which historian you study, almost half or over half of the people of Rome were slaves. And so the Romans had very strict rules about runaway slaves. If a slave was to run away, the Romans had a rule that if you know someone that's run away and they're a runaway slave, they're to be turned in. And the penalty was oftentimes death. At other times, they would take a hot branding iron and they would brand the word, the letter for F in Greek on their forehead, meaning fugitive. If they ever ran away, they were branded with that F on their forehead, fugitive. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to go through an ordeal like that. Amen? And so Onesimus runs away from home, and not only does he run away from home, he steals from Philemon, his master. What did he steal? I don't know for sure, but let me explain some things about slavery in Rome. It was not like slavery that you think of. Being a slave was not like you think of today in other places of the country. And by the way, there still is slavery in other countries today. Really, I'm serious. There's slave labor in the communist parties. There's sex trafficking. There's no more than sex slavery. Taking little children, some orphans, some they kidnap and steal for the, for the sheer pleasure of, of sex trafficking. They're slaves, little children. Some older women become slaves because they don't have any way to meet their needs and they yield to this slavery. There's what they call in other countries and in Rome, debtor slavery. In other words, if you owed money and you could never pay it back, you could turn yourself in to be a slave and you could agree on a certain amount of time that you would be a slave in order to pay your debt. It's called debtor's slavery. They also had debtor's prison. So to stay out of debtor's prison, you needed to become a, a, a slave to debt, debtor's slavery. Orphans of war were many times taken in in the slavery Captives of war. And Rome was a warring country, a warring empire. And when Rome would come in and they would capture and conquer a country, they would take the children and make them slaves. They would take the women that were younger and make them slaves to produce more slaves. Many of the slaves in the Roman Empire were very educated, very Powerful people. How can you prove that to me, preacher? Daniel was a slave. He was a Babylonian slave. Yet Daniel was an, such an articulate, such a powerful leader that he became president and a leader in the Babylonian Empire and stepping down to Persia and right on into the next uh, Belshazzar and Nebuchadnezzar and then into Darius the king. So Meshach Shadrach was also in slavery because Babylon had taken them and made them slaves. Roman soldiers would come in and many times orphans that their parents died, maybe in the war or maybe their, the, the mother died and the man had already been killed, they'd take orphans and make them slaves. Don't think of slaves as being unlearned, unskilled people. In the Roman Empire, slaves were trained and taught with great intellect and great skill to be carpenters, to be metal workers, to be harvesters, to be doctors, to be lawyers, to be book accountants, to be 
people that would take care of business for them? You say, prove that. Acts chapter 8. Remember, the eunuch was a slave to Candace the queen. And he was over all of her finances. He was a slave. Now, I wanted to say that, simply to say this. Daniel was a slave in the Babylonian kingdom and, and the Medes and the Persian. Enoch was a slave, or the eunuch rather. The eunuch was a slave in Acts chapter 8. Even the book called Luke, Dr. Luke, was more than likely a slave. Dr. Luke, yes, the one that wrote Luke in your four Gospels, Dr. Luke probably was a slave. He was a doctor, well-educated, but more than likely he was a slave to Theophilus. He writes back in the book of Acts to Theophilus, giving him all the journeys of Paul, writing to Theophilus. Why? Because Theophilus was his master. And Theophilus, no doubt, was converted by the great apostle Paul, gave his heart to Jesus Christ, and Theophilus gave Luke to Paul to be his special physician. Wow. So not all slaves were unlearned. Many of them were extremely skilled and powerful. And so you have Onesimus, and I don't know what his trade was, maybe carpentry, maybe, maybe it was in the area of, of, um, of maybe uh, the area of taking care of the household, tending the business. Maybe he was a book accountant. Maybe he took care of the finances like the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. Whatever he did, we don't know for sure, but whatever he did, he stole when he left Philemon. Maybe, and I'm speculating now, but maybe Onesimus was a bookkeeper. And maybe Philemon was going to balance the books. And maybe Onesimus was cooking the books. And maybe that's why he fled away. Some have suggested that Onesimus left because uh, Philemon was mean to him and cruel to him. I don't believe that because Philemon is a Christian here. Good Christians are not mean to people. If you're mean to people, you're not a good Christian. And I'd almost bet your two cents you've never been a Christian. Amen? Uh, you can tell I'm a high bidder here, two cents. Philemon, Paul speaks to him, and he, he talks about him in glorious ways. And the first thing that Paul says to him, now, you've got to see Paul's situation. Paul has met Onesimus, and Onesimus is a runaway slave. It was Paul's duty as a Roman person of Rome. Rome uh, Paul was, by his uh, uh, Roman name, Paul. It was his duty to turn Onesimus in as a slave. And the Roman Empire, they kept a firm grip on them because, stop and think about it. If you got 50, 60% of slavery in, a, in Rome and they rose up against Rome, they'd have a problem, wouldn't they? Serious problem. So they were very strict on slavery, Romans were. It was up to Paul to turn Onesimus in. But... In the book of Deuteronomy, God says through Moses, when a slave runs away and comes into your camp, you are to feed him, take care of him, and treat him like one of your own. So Paul said, okay, God trumps Rome. The Bible trumps Rome. And so Paul leads Onesimus to the Lord. Onesimus gets in saved by the power of Jesus Christ. And something come up in maybe John Mark saw that, aren't you the one, ain't you part of the household of Philemon over in Colossae? I don't know how it come out, but somewhere along the line, Paul found out that Onesimus was part of the church at Colossae in the house of Philemon. He was a slave, but nonetheless, he was part of the church of Colossae. 
The book of Colossians talks about this. And in fact, some of the latter part of Philemon is almost identical to the latter part of Colossians. So you have the church of Colossae. And we know by the scriptures, we don't have to exaggerate, we know that um, Onesimus attended church there with Philemon. Philemon's, the church of Colossae, met in Philemon's house. Let me show you something. Paul, a prisoner, he's writing to Philemon, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother. He, Timothy was probably visiting there, and probably Tychus was with him. And unto Philemon, he says, I'm writing to Philemon, our dearly beloved fellow laborer. Look at verse 2. And to our beloved Apia, Apia was probably uh, Philemon's wife, or Chippopus was probably Philemon's son, our fellow soldiers, and to the church in thy house, Colossians. That was the church in the house. And so Paul had led Philemon to the Lord. Philemon was a very wealthy man and probably, and I'm speculating again, but probably Philemon was born again when Paul was in Tri uh, uh, Trianus over in Ephesus. Remember, he spent a lot of time in in Trianus, the school of Trianus, and he probably was saved in a business trip going there. Philemon was probably saved during that, during that uh, process. So Philemon is a Christian. Paul knows Philemon. Onesimus says, well, I came from, you know, I escaped as a slave. I ran away. And Paul maybe said, well, where did you run from? He said, I ran from Philemon. And Paul maybe said, Philemon? I know Philemon. I know that the church of Colossae meets in his house. And so Onesimus, being born again now, has become a changed person and a blessed person. Go with me to Colossians real quickly. Are you getting anything out of this tonight? Hope you are. Colossians chapter 4. Look at verse 7. Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. All, my, all of my state, this is actually, Paul is saying, I'm telling you how I'm doing. All my state shall Tychus declare unto you. Tychus was there visiting Paul, and Tychus was a member of Colossae. He said, I'm sending Tychus with information of how I'm doing, who is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate. In other words, Paul says, I want to know how you're doing. I'm going to tell you how I'm doing and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, that's the slave that's been born again, a faithful, beloved brother who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all the things which are done here. So he's sending He's sending Tychus with Onesimus with three letters. He's sending three letters with them to Colossae. And those three letters, and this is going to shock you, but those three letters are Laodicea. Now, we don't have a Laodicean letter by Paul, but he did write to the church of Laodicea. And we need to understand that not only did he send the letter of Laodicea, which is not in our Bible because God chose not to keep it in the canon of the Scriptures, but the letter to Laodicea was there. And the other one was simply the book of Colossians, and the other one was the book of, or the letter of Philemon. Those three were sent by Paul to Colossae. Onesimus is to take his own letter with Tychus, and Tychus is to bring Colossians' letter, and he is to bring Laodicea's letter. Now, we need to understand that the Laodicea letter did not get in the canon of the Scriptures, but look at verse 16 of, of chapter 4 of Colossians. Chapter 4, verse 16 of Colossians. 
And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle of the Laodiceans. So we see there was an epistle to Laodicea. That's confirmed in Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. Now, I'm just laying down a little information. I'll, I'll preach in just a moment. You say, preacher, you're not too preachy tonight. Well, give me a, give me a, let me get my breath. We will do a little preaching tonight. And you're not going to probably like some of the things that will be said, but it's a great letter. Can you imagine Paul sending a letter to Philemon, and he's going to send it with Philemon's runaway slave? Three books are going to show up. We call them books, but they're letters. Colossians, Laodicea, and then Philemon. And they show up at church service in the house of Philemon. And lo and behold, there is Onesimus. What is he doing here? See, Philemon, if he was not a Christian, was in his full rights to kill him. He was in full rights to brand him in the forehead as a fugitive, a runaway slave. But Paul sends a letter to try to pull Philemon into a Christian attitude. How many know if it wasn't for this Bible, you would not have a Christian attitude? Amen? Some of you, some of you have an attitude already, but listen to me. You want a Christian attitude. And so Paul leads Onesimus to Jesus Christ, and Onesimus is saved. He's changed. He's a changed man. Born again. And Paul says, I'd like to keep him with me because he is beneficial to me here in prison. And I'd love to keep him as my own servant, but I think he needs to go back and see Philemon and try to clean up things. And let's see if we can't get some forgiveness between Philemon and Onesimus. And that's what this letter is about, getting forgiveness. Sometimes God calls on us to, to receive forgiveness as an Onesimus. Other times God calls on us to give forgiveness, like Philemon. The Christian life is made up of receiving forgiveness and giving forgiveness. And, and God's going to require you to forgive that person that has done you the most wrong. So you don't want to hear that, do you? But God's going to require you to forgive. In fact, some people get mad at God because things don't go the way they thought it should go and they think that God had cheated them out of something special in their life and they get angry and mad at God. You're going to have to forgive God too. Not because God needs your forgiveness, but because you need to forgive God because you're going to be worthless as long as you have bitterness toward God. Your life is going to be destroyed as long as you have bitterness toward God. God don't need your forgiveness, but you need to forgive God, not because he needs forgiveness. He don't need, he's done no wrong, but you need that forgiveness in your heart, and you need to forgive God, release it, let that bitterness destroy your life. Amen. I've met people. In fact, my brother, when he lost his little girl, to cancer, little Tanya, two years old, and this little girl was a brain tumor, took the little girl down to Memphis, down to, what's the name of that hospital? St. Jude, and they did everything they could, and the little baby was, the tumor kept growing. He believed God. Preacher said, thus saith the Lord, everything's going to be all right. And so much was said to him that it would be okay. But yet his little daughter, two-year-old, dies. When the little girl dies, she motions for her daddy to pick her up. And then she motioned back to the bed, and daddy laid her back down in the bed. And then she motioned to her mommy to pick her up. She kissed her mommy. She kissed her daddy, and mommy laid her back down. She motioned to go back down in the bed, and mommy laid her down in bed, and she died. She was gone. My brother, furious, 
Them preachers lied to me. God, how could you take a precious little girl? Well, God didn't. Cancer did. Yeah, but God permitted it. I don't know the future of that little girl. I don't know what awaits her, awaits her, but God knew. And my brother finally got saved in this church. And he released the bitterness and gave his heart to Christ. And soon after that, began to preach the gospel. You guys know Steve. He preached the gospel. But he buried a little girl and could not understand why. That's why we need this Bible. I told you I'd get preachy. And so Paul says, I'm going to send Onesimus back to you, Philemon. Because I think Philemon was pretty angry. And I think Onesimus was pretty scared. And Onesimus needed forgiveness. Oh, he was forgiven. He was saved by Jesus Christ. But he needed to be released from his master. And so Paul sends him with a letter. Did you know God's sending me with a letter to the throne? It's right here. God's sending me with a letter to heaven. It's right here. I'm taking it with me. I'm not leaving this earth. I'm not leaving this planet without God's word buried deep in the bedrock of my heart. Because I've done wrong. But God's a forgiving God. Amen? Now, notice he says to Philemon, before he sends Onesimus there, he brags on Philemon. Actually, Philemon, you are a refreshing. That's what, that's what Paul said to Philemon. I'm sending a letter, and in that letter, Philemon, in Colossae, you are a refreshing. That's what he says in verses 1 through 7. You're refreshing. He said, you're a, you're a man of love. You're a great person, you, you, you refresh, verse 7, uh, it says, because of the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. I love that. Everybody's refreshed by you, brother. Well, I see God, see Paul spreading on the compliments because he's sending someone with this letter that Onesimus was probably pretty well put out with. He'd stole from him. He had ran from him. And so Paul sends him and says, I know what kind of man you are, Philemon. You're a, you're a man that refreshes people's hearts. I want to ask you a question. Are you a person that refreshes people's hearts? Are you a person when you get around people? Are you a refreshing or do they need freshener to get rid of you? Huh? Which one is it? Are you a refreshing? Are you refreshing when someone gets around you? You're, are you refreshing? You encourage them? Or do they need to get out something to spray to, to, so that you, they can freshen up the stale and the stench of your attitude and your spirit? I want to be a refreshing to people. A refreshing. And Paul says, Philemon, that's what you are. You're refreshing. The church meets in your house. You praise God. You trust Jesus. You're saved. You're a man of love. You're a man of grace. And I'm sending someone to you. Sending three letters. By Tychus and Onesimus. Now notice verse, uh, notice uh, if you look at verse uh, I'm going to read it because it's important that you see this. Verse, verse uh, 8 through 18. That's quite a bit of reading, but let's look at it and see what God's doing. 8 through 18. Now, I want you to notice, Paul ne never says he's an apostle. He could have, but he never did. Notice what he says. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake... I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. I led him to the Lord while I chained his soldiers, which in times past was to thee unprofitable, now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels. 
whom I would have retained, I'd have kept him with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of my of the gospel. But without thy mind, without your permission, would I do nothing, that they benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, maybe Onesimus went astray for, a, for God's reason, thou shouldest receive him forever as a born again child of God. Verse 16, not now as a servant, but above a servant. You receive Onesimus not as a slave, but receive him as a brother, beloved, especially to me. But now much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. Wow. Notice Paul did not pull out the apostle card. He didn't. He says in the scripture that I just read to you that he could have. He could have ordered Philemon to forgive, receive, but he chose not to pull out the apostle card. He said, I could demand that you do it, but I want you to do it out of love. Notice he uses three things that he, he challenges um, Philemon with. He says three things. This is why I want you to receive Onesimus. Verse 9, because of love, because of love, I beseech you. And then Paul says, because I'm old, I'm aged. And number three, because I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Those are the three reasons I want you to receive Onesimus. I'm old, I'm a prisoner, and love demands it. Isn't that beautiful? He says, receive him as you would receive me. He said, take him and receive him just like you would receive me. How many would agree that, that, Philemon, would have rece- that, that Philemon would have received Paul open arms? best food, best bed to sleep in, give him the best. And Paul says, I want you to treat Onesimus just like you would me. Receive him like you would me. I love this. And notice what he says. And this is important to see this. Whom I, whom I would have retained, I'd have kept him in verse 13 with me, that instead he might have ministered unto me both in bonds and government. So Paul says, I'd like to keep him. But he said, I'm not going to keep him. I'm sending him to you. And if he's wronged you, if he owes you, verse 18, put that on mine account. Sounds like Jesus. Put that on my account. If he's wronged you, if he's robbed you, put that on my account. You know what Paul was saying to Philemon? He was saying, if he's wronged you, forgive him like you would me. And if he owes you anything, I'll go to work and I'll do what needs to be done to pay you back. I'll pay the bill. Just forgive him. Can you imagine? Paul says, when I get there, I'll work for you. I'll pay the bill off. Forgive him. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? I said, that sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? I love this. This is beautiful. He said, I'll pay it. I'll take care of it. Receive him as you would me. Now, here's the good verse. This is my favorite verse in, in, in Philemon. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say unto thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self. Paul is saying, I'm asking you to do this out of love. I'm old. I'm in prison. I'm asking you to do this as a good Christian. I'll pay the debt. You forgive him. I'll do everything. But don't you forget, Philemon, you owe me. <laughs> you got to admit, that's pretty cool writing. You owe me. Isn't that beautiful? 
So number three, you owe me, so refresh me. You owe me, so refresh me. So where do you find that? Verse 19 and 20. Yea, verse 20, yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in, in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. You owe me, now refresh me. The last part of this is pretty cool too. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. In other words, uh, um, uh, I want you to know, Philemon, that you're going to do more than I've asked you to do because you owe me. Isn't that good? I mean, oh, Jesus Christ could say the same thing to everybody in this room. You owe me. You owe me. I owe Jesus. I owe him my life. And Paul says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to refresh me. Look at verse 21 through 25. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say, but withal prepare me also a lodging place. He says, get ready, I'm coming to see you. That's even, that sounds like Jesus. You owe me, I'm coming back to see you. Do right. Live right, talk right, I bought you, you owe me, I'm coming back to see you. I mean, if Paul showed up and Onesimus had been killed or branded, Paul would not be happy at all. You know, he says, I'm coming. Now, now why is he coming? So I wrote unto you, verse 21, knowing that thou wilt do more than I have said, but withal prepare me also lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. So I take it you're praying for me. God's going to answer them prayers. By, what, by the way, this was the first imprisonment in Rome, not the second. Some say there was a third. So he did get out. And he did go to Colossae. Verse 23, therefore salute the Ephraim, which was the founder of Colossae, my fellow prisoner in Christ. He had ended up in jail. Marcus, that's John Mark, Artarchus, and then you have Demas, that's the one that betrayed the Lord. Lucas is John Luke, or Luke, the Gospel of Luke, Luke, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Wow. That's quite a letter, isn't it? Quite a letter. Now, I want you to visualize this. They're getting ready to have church. Tychus and Onesimus walks through the door. They're, 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 in the, they're on their second psalm they're singing. They've had prayer. Forgive us of our debts as we forgive those that have indebted to us. They've had the Lord's prayer. They've talked to the Lord. They've sung. Philemon's right there. Ooh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. And he looks, and lo and behold, through his door comes Tychus and Onesimus. And Philemon's probably saying, you dirty dog, you. What are you doing here? You stole from me. And Tychus and Onesimus brings three letters and lays them at the podium, the place of reading. And they read the first Colossae to the church of Colossus, Colossians. They read Laodicea, later there and also at Laodicea. But there's a personal letter. And Onesimus don't even know what's in it. It's been sealed by the seal of Paul. It's had a Roman seal on it. Paul has wrote it itself. And Paul tells Onesimus, trust me. It's going to be all right. Trust me, Philemon's a good man. Trust me. He's a good master. Trust me. And so Onesimus brings that letter. He hadn't read it. He probably wanted to, but he hadn't read it. And he carried it to Philemon. And maybe Onesimus handed it to him like this. And Philemon opens it and says, Oh, 
it's from Paul. And Paul starts in spreading in the butter. Man, you are refreshing. You're a great man of God. I have confidence in you. Now I've sent someone to you, Onesimus. I led him to Jesus. Don't you call him a slave anymore? Call him a brother. Just as you would treat me, you treat him. You take care of him. You forgive him. If he owes you anything, I'll pay it. And if he's taken from you, I'll just forgive him. I'll, pay. I'll go to work for him. I'll pay it. Just forgive. And so Onesimus is now needing forgiveness, and Philemon is now needing to give it. And that's the life of you and I. We all are Philemons, and we all are Onesimuses. Sometimes we must be forgiven. Other times we must forgive. And he reads it, and Paul tells his story, how he led him to Jesus, how he's a pro I'd like to keep him, but I didn't keep him because he belongs to you. He's a slave. I'm sending him away. I'd like to have him back. We don't know if he was sent back to Paul or not. But he sends him there with his own letter, and Onesimus gives him the letter, and he reads it. I think before Philemon had that letter read all the way through, I believe revival broke out in the house of Philemon. I believe before that letter was finished reading, it was a personal letter, and he may have read it in silence. Philemon may have been standing there trembling, reading this letter of Paul, reading it in silence, and oh, Onesimus saying, I hope, I hope, I hope he don't kill me. I hope, I hope, I hope he don't kill me. Because Onesimus don't know what's in that letter. And Philemon's reading and he's nervous. It's quiet. Quiet all over the house of Philemon. Church of Colossae meeting. Reads it in silence. And all of a sudden Philemon says, Brother Onesimus, come here. Let me hug you, Brother. Let me tell you, friends, there's no such thing as a slave and a Christian. We're all brothers and Christians if we're born again. There's no such thing as one out and one in. As children of God, we're all one. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. No such thing. A, 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 a slave may be teaching Sunday school while a master sits and listens to him. Jesus Christ tears every wall and division down bringing us to blood kin with Jesus as children of God. Isn't that beautiful? And I believe revival broke out. I believe revival broke out. Woo! Praise the Lord. And Tychus takes the letter on. They read the letter to Laodicea. And I think they did read the letter of Philemon eventually because it became part of our Bible. So I'm obviously, if all of us are going to read it, he's going to let, let the rest of them read it. Amen. Don't think you're so privileged that you and I are the only ones who got to read it. I think the house of Colossae got to read it too. But in the beginning, I think it was private mail. Amen. If somebody walked in, to, walked in here and they had hand you a letter and it's, it's addressed to your name, you. And they hand you a letter and it's sealed. And it's someone that you would consider of great importance, great Christian leadership. Would you say, attention everybody, I've got this letter, don't know what it says, well, I'm going to open it up, read it for all of you to hear it. No, you're not. You're going to stoop down behind the chairs and you're going to... And if it's a good letter, you're going to wave it at them. Woo! Woo! Let me share this letter with you. But until then, you're going to do peekaboo. Right? And I want you to know Jesus sent us. He's sending us a letter. We read it. And we're to forgive. And we're to care for one another. And one day we'll go to heaven. And we can wave that letter. Woohoo! Jesus saved my soul. The blood has washed me clean. I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Because Jesus' personal letter to you 
makes all the difference in the world. Stand with me. Isn't that good? Hallelujah. Did you get anything out of it? God's going to call on us to be forgiven, and he's going to call on us to forgive others. Is there someone in your heart right now that you need to forgive? You say, no, I just don't like them. Is there someone in your heart you need to forgive? Nah, I just avoid them at Walmart. Nah, I just avoid them wherever they are. Now, I don't wish anything bad on them. I just want them to drop dead. But anyway, so we need to forgive. We need to love, amen? There's, there's people out there in the world that would like to see me drop dead, but I'm not going to do it. I am not going to give them the pleasure of that. I am not going to drop dead. If I'm going to die, I'm going to be an old, stinky, smelly old man. Opinionated. Squeak when I walk. Old. And not care what anybody thinks when I say something. I'm going to say what I want to say. I'm almost there, ain't I? Almost there. When I quit taking a bath, I'll be there. But you got to forgive. you got to release it. And you've got to be forgiven. And Jesus wants to forgive you. But remember, forgive us of our debts as we forgive those that are debtors. We need to be a forgiver. Let it go. Let it go. And the worst kind of anger would be having a ought and an anger toward God. That's the worst kind. You've got to let it go. Release it. Not because God needs released. You're bound. You need released. And you've got to forgive. He doesn't need forgiveness, but you've got to let it go. You've got to release that and allow the Spirit of God to touch your life. Amen. Historians tell us, and I'm not going to say, quote, unquote, this is accurate, but historians tell us that Onesimus went on to build a great church and became a great bishop in the church of Jesus Christ. Could be. I don't know. But when I get to heaven, I'll ask him. Amen. What an awesome God. God can use anybody. But he can't use anyone if they're not forgiven. You've got to be forgiven to be used. And you've got to release people to be used of the Lord. I can't stress it enough. You cannot be haunted and live in the past of bitterness and hurt. You've got to release it. You've got to release it and walk in the grace of God. Walk in the mercy of God. Hey, we got a great big everlasting future to look forward to. Don't waste it on a dirty heartbreaking past. Spend all your time looking to the future. How glorious our Savior is. Amen. Woo! Praise the Lord. Don't waste it living in the past. Look to the future. Trust your Jesus. Y'all's going to sing. We're going to give you an invite. Maybe there's someone in your heart you need to forgive. Maybe there's maybe you need forgiveness. That is available tonight. All you have to do is make that step toward Christ. Whether you're needing forgiveness or whether you need to give forgiveness, it's all right here as you come to Jesus.